Hey there, before I begin today's episode of Potterless, I wanted to say welcome and thank you to all of our new listeners. Spotify decided to put Potterless as one of its featured podcasts, which baffles me, but because of that, we've had a ton of new listeners over the course of March, so I wanted to say thank you to all of you for listening, welcome to the team, and also many of you have reached out on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook, and said, I've caught up on Potterless, I don't know what to do now. Well, I have the answer for you. You should check out some of the shows on Multitude. Multitude is a production collective that Potterless is a part of, and currently there are three other podcasts on this collective. And chances are, if you enjoyed some of our guests on Potterless, you will love these podcasts because almost everyone involved in Multitude has been on Potterless. If you enjoyed Eric Schneider, Amanda McLaughlin, and Slash or Julia Shafini's appearances on Potterless, you will love both Waystation, which is a fan cast for the Canadian show Lost Girl, as well as Spirits, which is basically like drunk history, but hosted by two ladies about mythology. They do old mythology stories and then talk about modern interpretations for them. And they also do local hometown folklore stories. I actually guest hosted an episode and talked about basketball. So there's a bunch of good stuff over on Spirits. And if you enjoyed the Eric Silver episodes, you will love Join the Party, which is a real play Dungeons and Dragons podcast that has amazing sound editing, amazing storytelling, and some really captivating characters and a great community of listeners. I guest starred as a little cameo role as a book, so what's not to love? Any and all of the information about those shows can be found at multitude.productions. Speaking of welcome and thanks, we have to welcome and thank our newest patrons. So shout out to Mladen Dribnjakovic, K. Chris Gliz, Pujitha Krishnan, Brooke Bauer, Brandy, Joshua Pearson, Natalie Collier, Nicola Blucher, Christian Jagodinsky, Anna Turner, Juliana Serrano, Mariko Fujimoto, Jonathan Castle, Bedroom Soliloquies, Story Musa, Anastasia Alexander, Mariana Diaz, Rolandas Paulu Becas, Michelle Anderson, Alfie Lopez, Patrick Herring, Eliza Watson, Noel Crump, Marcelina Massenbach, Christy Brown, Skylar Copeland, Lorelai, Tristan, and Christian Wojcicki. And a huge shout out to our newest producer level patrons, Sheila Vidianothan, Jenna Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Luis Nusak, Akanksha Saxena, and Sarah Salvador. They join the ranks of Leanne, Andreas, Vicky, Aaron, Erica, Calvin, Michael, Sadie, Jesse, Natalie, Deborah, Daisy, Clow, Michael, Sean, Alexander, Rebecca, Frank, Marchismo, Tori, Samantha, Troy, and Juan, who never have to lie to their dentists about flossing because they always remember to floss. If you want to be like these amazing people and support the podcast and in exchange get access to bonus content like exclusive live streams, stickers, shirts, bonus episodes, access to my notes that I reference in the episodes, you can check all of that out at patreon.com slash potterless. And honestly, thank you to everyone who has helped support the podcast, whether it is through Patreon or by posting about Potterless on social media or telling your friends about it, really, word of mouth is the best way to help Potterless grow. So I want to give a sincere thank you to everyone who has done that. So without further ado, let's get into episode 38 of Potterless, covering chapter one, yes, just chapter one, of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, guest starring Misha Stanton of Ars Paradoxica. Hello, Internet, and welcome back to another episode of Potterless, the journey of a grown man reading the Harry Potter series for the first time. I'm that grown man. My name is Mike Schubert, and I'm here joined by the creator of Ars Paradoxica, and I don't know what your title is for the Bright Sessions, Misha Stanton. Misha, how is it going? Hello. It's going great. Yeah, I have so many numerous and varied titles on so many different podcasts yes. that it's just, <laughs> it's ridiculous at this point. You're just like podcast sage for any audio drama that exists. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I, try to, shape or form. I try to help out where I can. I don't know. I've done work on... <laughs> Oh, Ars Paradoxica and the Bright Sessions and Wolf 359 and Our Fair City and the Far Meridian and I Hate My Boss, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. So if there's an audio drama that you like, Misha has probably worked on it. So. That's fair to say. <laughs> so Misha and I met at PodCon and I was really excited to, to have them on the show because you're not a big fan of Harry Potter. Is that right? No, I'm famously, I now I've been on a couple of interviews where I have talked about my dislike of Harry Potter. I'm not the biggest fan. Uh, that's good. I try to have different opinions and different takes on the show. So this makes me excited. What I'm, I'm sure the answer will probably be you hate the time travel in the third book, but is there like <laughs> what, what in particular makes you the most upset or what has led you to not be the biggest fan of Harry Potter? I dislike that there doesn't seem to be a rule to how magic works. Okay, magic cool. just doesn't make sense to me. And 
leads to characters making decisions that don't make sense to me. Okay, super valid. It's something that I've, I think because I'm a very critical type person, like I majored in engineering in college and my normal person job is as an engineer. I like when there are rules that you're supposed to adhere by. Yes, I'm right there with you. And the fact that there has never really been an explanation of like what you can and can't do with magic, that makes me a little upset and just kind of like grinding my teeth because they introduce new spells and I'm like, wait, what? Huh? Why is she allowed to do this? Yeah. I've heard that they get a little bit more into the details of that in the sixth and seventh book, but at least what I've read so far, uh, which is five books and then the first four chapters, which we're going to cover uh, of the sixth book, I haven't seen anything that's like, you know, here are the laws of thermodynamics a la magic. And that's the one thing that makes me the most upset. I mean, I don't want to spoil it for you because the, yes, the whole premise don't. of this podcast is literally <laughs> you listening to it for the first time. Yep. But they don't. They don't ever really get into it. Oh, um, no. Okay. No, but I mean, I I could recommend other series that I read in protest <laughs> that I found. <laughs> um, the biggest two series that come up in response to magic doesn't have rules is you should check out the Dresden Files okay. and the Name of the Wind. Okay. I will look into these. These could maybe be bonus material stuff or future episodes when I run out of Harry Potter books to read. Oh Ooh. man, I would love to hear Potterless takes on Name of the Wind. That would be exciting. Okay. I'll have to check it out. Well, that is for a future day. What we are here to discuss in this episode is chapters one and two of Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, yes. which is a lot of people's favorite books. So I'm super stoked. So let's get right into it. We open with chapter one, which is called The Other Minister. So right off the bat, I was so hyped because I've asked this multiple times throughout reading these. It's like, why have we never understood the perspective of the Muggle Prime Minister? And now we're getting a whole chapter devoted to him. I'm, I was so stoked when I read that right off the bat. I could honestly read... Now, this will belie my... I mean... Here I am. I'm a nerd. I could read an entire book that was just the UK government and their relations with the magical government. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's so much there oh, that totally, like you totally. could go so hard, especially because of what happens in this chapter. Yep. Like that we see the relations and now oh, yeah. I want to know everything. Yes. I really enjoyed this chapter. And the second chapter is also not from Harry's perspective. And honestly, when it got to the third chapter, which is another Harry Potter perspective chapter, I was kind of disappointed. I was like, oh man, I really like this fun change of pace for two chapters. Uh, but yeah, this is going to be a weird episode of Potterless where Potter isn't in these two chapters. Yep, This entire episode of Potterless will not feature Harry Potter. Honestly, kind of a good thing because he's not that great the most potterless episode of potterless oh, ever oh my god we're totally putting that in the tagline of something this is literally <laughs> the most potterless episode okay so let's get into it so we get into the we see the prime minister of the muggle world he is reading a memo but he's not really processing what is on the memo because apparently he's had a really rough week He's recalling that there's something that happened with a bridge that unexpectedly fell, so I'm assuming it got magicked to death. Uh, there's also, they mention, like, the member of the opposing party was really on his case, but it never says which party the prime minister belongs to, and there's they just don't. a lot of, like, vague... Uh, like politics jabs there but they're not <laughs> aimed at anything particularly yeah they mention it later um about his opponent but there's something where it's like his opponent like is is taking glee in the fact that people are dying while this guy is the prime minister which like is beyond me uh it's it, i ugh, ugh, that's I politics know. baby <laughs> i know that's the game so much oh they make politics <laughs> make me so sad it's so grody <laughs> so basically there there's been this bridge that fell out of nowhere there was a freak hurricane that apparently came there's some person named herbert chorley that has been acting weird and the weather's been really bad there's fog all over the place so apparently it's just been the week from hell and while he's reading over this memo, he hears a cough in the room that he recognizes, but no one is in the room. Ooh, you learn. Ooh, spooky. Ooh. <laughs> so you learn that it's coming from a painting of a man in a silvery wig inside the room. And clearly this is a magical painting. He has a message from Fudge. For when he first announces it, he was like, this is a message for the prime minister of muggles, which has to be demeaning that someone else is giving you a different title. Oh my gosh. It's just like, oh, you're finally the prime minister of the normies. <laughs> you don't get to be the prime minister of the cool people. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yes, exactly. So this painting person says that Fudge needs to meet with the prime minister ASAP. 
The Muggle Prime Minister says that he can't. He's waiting on the call from a president of a distant land. So again, they don't say where it is, but whatever it is, we've narrowed down the list of countries because it's one that has a president. Yeah, I mean, it's again, they're trying not to name specific things like parties and countries. I mean, it's clearly America, right? I would assume so, but uh, we're not sure. Yeah. So this painting says that uh, they will make this president forget to call and will call the prime minister tomorrow night, which I think is super dope. I don't know how all that works, uh, all but right. it's great. <laughs> here's, where, here's where I want to jump in on <laughs> what I'm sure is going to be a multi-part rant. Good, good, good. It is one thing to blank memories on an official capacity, which I have a ton of problem with throughout this chapter. Sure. But you're just going to do it to the leader of a foreign nation? <laughs> that is against so many Geneva Conventions. <laughs> what? Yeah, you can't just bit... do that. <laughs> yeah, the implications could be really bad. Also, like, what if the president of this foreign country has something scheduled, very important scheduled, for the time tomorrow when you're going to make him call... The prime minister. Right. Now you're getting into like the president's secretary's life and making that miserable. And I've seen the West Wing. A lot of people's <laughs> lives are affected by the president's life. Hey, but you know what? Wizards are more important, <laughs> apparently. Jeez. Oh, How <laughs> conceited are wizards always? Quite, quite conceited, actually. So <laughs> Fudge flew powders in. And basically, the prime minister is not excited to see Fudge because the only time he sees Fudge is when bad things happen. So apparently Fudge looks rough. Just, you know, his skin looks rough. His hair looks rough. He has got big bags under his eyes. Not looking too great. Uh, bad times in Fudge land. Yeah, not too, not too great for the Fudgester. Can I just point out, um, it's been, this is the first time I've... Uh, read the Harry Potter any part of a Harry Potter novel since I finished the seventh one when I was gosh sixteen, uh -huh. and like so I've interacted more with the movies I guess, but I didn't realize that Fudge wears a lime green bowler hat yep, the whole time. Yep, just a really bright green bowler hat. Yep. This Where is do something, I get one? <laughs> this is something I've touched on in the podcast that it makes me so sad that uh, at some point in the series, I believe in the fourth or fifth book, they establish that the lime green bowler hat is his most defining article of clothing that he wears like it's his trademark signature accessory and the fact that this didn't translate over oh, to man. the movies how could you not vote so for that sad. guy <laughs> i mean yeah. my thought was that a lime green bowler the only larger red flag than a lime green bowler is a giant red flag like if he physically carried around a red flag <laughs> <laughs> anywhere he was but yeah it just gets lost in the movies which one of the i mean as i've seen because i've been watching the movies after i finished the books as i've seen the movies suck i don't mm -hmm. know why anyone liked them or if anyone did like them because <laughs> they leave out all the good stuff but yeah the lime green bowler left on the cutting room floor they leave i mean they do leave out a bunch of good stuff but i sort of even forgot how much got left out mm -hmm. i i can't imagine normally somebody walking out of a fireplace when i don't normally interact with magic things but then he's walking out of a green fire with a lime green bowler hat i would think i was on drugs yep 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 and not the good ones no. so the regular prime minister motions for fudge to sit in quote the hardest of the chairs in the room which i don't know if this is because he doesn't like fudge or what or he like wants him to be uncomfortable i thought it was a interesting detail to throw in there he's like you magic people can make it comfortable for yourselves i don't need to waste time and taxpayer money on that sort of thing don't sit in one of my good chairs sit in my designated uncomfortable chair for magic people <laughs> this is where the magos live <laughs> so they both reminisce about their rough week dealing with these disturbances and murders and they allude that magical people which i'm assuming they mean the death eaters are at fault for all of this destruction so the Prime Minister hates Fudge's visits because in addition to giving bad news, he's also very condescending. And then we get a bunch of flashbacks to every other time that Fudge has visited the Prime Minister. And I have made fun of this in every episode of Potterless that covers the beginning of a book, that they recap what has happened in the previous books. This is actually the most clever use of recapping the book ever because they do it so well without being super heavy handed. And finally, she did a good way to like jog the reader's memory without being like in the first book of the series. Like it made it, it made me so happy. Yeah, that's true. This is a really good expositionary moment mm -hmm. it because it's it's all has having to be explained to someone with an entirely different perspective that you've never seen in the books before exactly exactly it made me wish that every book 
did some sort of recap tool like this and was from a different person's perspective. Like one, it could be people gossiping about what they heard at the school and another one could be, I don't know, people talking about it in a bar or something. I thought it would be so much more fun if they did this every single time and you got to hear all these outside perspectives before we inevitably get into the Harry Potter chapters. Well, the problem with that is that there's only like three or four bars that exist in all of Magic <laughs> England. Yeah, this apparently. this is true. Or at least in uh, at least in Hogsmeade, which I don't know. Do do regular people go to Hogsmeade or is it like an exclusive? It's not just like the students of Hogwarts, right? It's just like anyone. Hangs no, out there. I, it's it's definitely. And they allude to this like later in book six and book seven, like after you graduate Hogwarts, you then move to like a magical community. And there's just like a bunch of magic villages in England that are just kind of hidden from the normal world. Oh. And Hogsmeade is one of them, I think. Oh, OK. That's really cool. That makes me think that no one cool would actually go to Hogsmeade because it's like, oh, there's all the kids there. Gross. <laughs> like, yeah, I think it's like it must be the equivalent of like a, a, a college town. Yeah, you know? yeah. And like, and like, like, oh, the kids are coming in for the weekend again. Yeah, exactly. Like you avoid the bars where all like the dumb college kids go. Yep, 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 yep. I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to you the flashbacks, the first of which is the prime minister's first day on the job. And it's also his first introduction to the magical world because apparently no one told him this was a thing. Yeah, there's no like American, <laughs> there's no like equivalent to the president's books book of secrets nope. for the prime minister apparently I not and no one warns him because he's just in the office on the first day and then all of a sudden fudge flew powders in and has to prove that he's not a hoax the way that he does is by turning a teacup into a gerbil because that's proof and also like here have this gerbil that you didn't ask for and also maybe you should get some more tea if you want that because that's calming like why would you take away the one thing that's going to calm a british person down yeah oh my gosh and just make it worse exactly so the prime minister asks why has no one told me about this which is super valid and fudge says that the magical community finds telling the prime minister on their first day in office is the best way to keep it secret which like i get but maybe I wrote down my notes like, why hasn't his predecessor passed anything along? And then literally the next line in the book is the prime minister going, why hasn't a former prime minister told me? And then Fudge laughs and says, well, are you going to tell anyone? And then leaves. And that's yes, I'm going to tell the next person in this job because I'm a responsible politician <laughs> yes, and governor. Right. Like, what? Like, it's I guess Fudge's point here is like, oh, no one will believe you. But if you tell the dude on your last day slash his first day or whatever, then the guy could maybe think for a couple of hours, this guy's crazy. And then when someone flew powders in with a lime green bowler hat, they'd be like, never mind. Yeah. Oh, I guess that person was right. And now let's move on with the process of governing a country. <laughs> yeah. Like, and this is, this is a big problem I have with this, with the relations between the m muggle and magical governments is that like, not telling the muggle government everything that happens with the magical community yeah. puts the muggle community at severe risk. It's really and bad. puts them in danger. Yeah, it's super problematic. And like they give they give muggles no agency in the matter to decide their own fates vis-a-vis -vis the response to the po most powerful dark wizard that ever lived. Yeah. It's it's very strange to me. But I don't know. I guess that shows how poorly run the ministry is. That's my big issue is that like <laughs> really ideally the only thing you can do is tell the entire country. Like, why is this a secret? Mm -hmm. How can that lead to anything except mistrust and danger? Yeah. And my question, like, there's another question is, like, what are the relations between the British magical government and other magical governments that are working underneath normal governments and in shadows? Because it might not be the same as, like, governmental relations above board and, like, what if magical England wants to declare war on magical Germany, but mm -hmm. they don't tell their respective countries? Like, what, is, what do they do? Yeah, it's bad. They need to have, like, some sort of UN situation because it, it would be different if magical stuff couldn't harm muggles. But we have seen instances with the, you know, Peter Pettigrew, when Sirius Black got blamed for it and everything, like, 13 muggles died. Yeah. And it's like, this, this is not okay. There needs to be communication between the two. The most responsible thing to do would be, A, tell the populace. B, tell the populace. <laughs> and C, set up a permanent position in both governments where you basically have, like, ambassadors. Mm -hmm. Where you have, like, a secretary of magical affairs and a secretary of yeah. muggle affairs. Exactly. They really should. 
Gosh. I don't know. Let's go rewrite how the ministry works. <laughs> so the prime minister... Let's go overthrow the magical government and install our oh, own. Oh, yes, a coup. A magical coup d'etat. Uh, <laughs> so the prime minister gives the gerbil away to the niece and then tries to have this painting removed, but it wouldn't budge. It was attempted to be removed by carpenters, right, that's gotta builders, be magic, right? It's like magically Right? <laughs> I don't know how that works. It's like magically stuck to the wall. Like you like fused it to the wall with magic or something. I don't know. Tell yep. me how magic works. You can do it. <laughs> so carpenters, builders, an art historian, and the chancellor of the, uh, ex uh, ex I don't know how to pronounce this, the accessor, accessor, the E-X-C-H-E-Q-U-E-R, which is a real position. It's the British way to say like the treasure. Oh, the accessor? Yeah, the accessor. There we go. It said the chancellor of the accessor. And I was like, this isn't real. And then I Googled it and Google was like, yeah, it is, you idiot. So <laughs> that's the uh, British way to say treasurer is chancellor of the accessor. Like that's better than being the prime minister because you have a way better title. Like who cares, man? I would want to be a treasurer. It sounds like you're in charge of all the excess. It sounds like you are specifically Ooh. in charge of the excess of things. Which sounds that's great. That's like a nice decadent job to have. King of the leftovers. I'm down. <laughs> the other interaction with Fudge was three years prior with the serious Black escaping from Azkaban thing. And what's really great since this is kind of from the prime minister's perspective is that Sirius is written like the word serious like i o u s at the end which i think is just a great little touch i think there's another <laughs> one right in that right in that section that, yeah they do quidditch like, and they spell it with a k well. they do quidditch but it's spelled with a kw k-w-i-d-d-i-c-t-c-h mm -hmm. it makes me confused i'm so confused on who the actual narrator of the books is though because people have said that the books are narrated from harry's perspective but like clearly these two chapters are not harry no the books are definitely narrated from like a somewhat playful third person narrative that chooses to sit on people's shoulders. Okay, that's what I've thought. And people have called me out on this specifically because one of my biggest things that I make fun of the book for is that in book one and in book five, they call the put outer the put outer, like the thing that Dumbledore uses to take the lights out of street lamps. Oh, like the lighter thing, the, yeah, the street light people thing. People are have yelled at me. They're like, it's called the deluminator. The only reason that the narrator calls it the put outer in these books is because the narrator is taking Harry's perspective and Harry doesn't know what it's called. But I, I don't know if they clarify this later. They still haven't touched on it. Dumbledore uses the deluminator in chapter three and they don't, or the, no, fuck. He uses the put outer in chapter three, but they don't call it anything. And I just like, I'm confused on who the narrator is. I don't, I don't, it's, yeah. It's just a third person. It's just sort of like whoever's perspective we need to be following, which is mostly Harry's because the book is not called, you know, Cerverus Snape and that kid who annoys him. <laughs> oh, that one's, like, I, I'd read that. I'd buy that real quick. Well, that's the thing is like, it's not called that. It's called Harry Potter and the whatever, yeah. whatever. So you have, usually you're following Harry Potter, but like, especially in book six and seven, where the, the narrative kind of opens up to this sort of, warlike mentality you need to follow more perspectives because you need to know more of what's going on than harry can see with his one set of eyes exactly and there have been instances in the past where the narrator knows more than harry does so i don't know whenever i get into this put out or deluminator thing that'll be a, a different argument but oh i'm arguing, still arguing with fans of harry potter about what things are called is a losing battle my oh, friend oh i have learned any negative review of potterless that exists mentions that i pronounce things wrong which apparently upsets people people a lot which i didn't think was that big of a deal if i said made up words you wrong know, because they're made up words seriously <laughs> like and it's not like you're going off of the audiobook where there's a standard or you're going off, you're going off the books you read it on a page when you read a word on a page it doesn't always tell you how to pronounce it <laughs> exactly and i i have Chill listened out. i have listened to the audiobooks sometimes for this if i'm like you know reading at work or whatever i'll audio, i'll go between the books and the audiobooks but there are multiple people that have done the audiobooks like there's the jim dale ones and there are are the Stephen Fry ones, and they pronounce words differently. Jim Dale doesn't say the T oh, yeah. in Voldemort. He says Voldemort, and then the Stephen Fry one, he says Voldemort with a harsh T. And in the movies, they say Voldemort with a harsh T, but then J.K. Rowling has on quote said that you're not supposed to pronounce the T because it's from the French word, which talks about death or whatever. For, yeah, flight, fr flight from death. Yeah, like we're going to need a dictionary that's got like the freaking, you know, phonetic spelling before we decide what things are pronounced. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> also, one star reviews only make me grow stronger. I still haven't. I've gotten one star ones, but none with text. Uh, so the only one star reviews I've gotten are when people just leave and don't say anything. But I've had three star ones where they're like, it's OK, but he pronounces things wrong and it makes me upset. <laughs> <laughs> that's almost funny. Uh, it's good. It's a fun time. Anyway, you know, please rate and review the show. <laughs> yeah, really please does. rate the review the show five stars. We love you. <laughs> oh, let me 
love you guys so much. Thanks. Okay. Fudge basically just kind of busted in and starts ranting about the serious black thing rather than tell the prime minister what happened. He's just like, oh God, this guy broke out of jail and I'm so mad. In this flashback, we learn a key thing, which is that Azkaban is in the middle of the North Sea. And this is something that I don't know that they explicitly said in the books before this time, oh. but it's something they showed in the fifth movie when they show Bellatrix escaping. Is yeah, I don't recall cube. if they say it in the third book or if they're just like, it's a big prison. Yeah, I don't, if they did, I, I missed it, but I don't think that, I, I'm not sure that they mentioned it or if they did, they didn't mention that it was like the North Sea specifically, but it was this really cool image when I watched the fifth movie of just like this big metal cube in the middle of a roaring sea. And I was like, that's so tight. Where did they come up with that? And apparently they came up with it from book six. Yeah. Either that or I missed it before, which I've done. And then the Avengers stole it for Captain America Civil War because then they just did that with yep. the Avengers. Yeah, they pretty much did. But what are you going to do? <laughs> so Fudge tells the prime minister to take a seat so he can tell him about all this stuff uh, about Azkaban and Voldemort and all that. This is like the first time he's learned about it. And when he tells him to sit down, he's like, you ought to have a glass of whiskey. And there's a great quote from the narrator that says the prime minister rather resented being told to sit down in his own office, let alone being offered his own whiskey. <laughs> it's like. It's just a funny thing by Fudge. Like, imagine someone busting into your house and then grabbing your own liquor and then being like, care for a drink? Like, you're doing them a favor. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is that, like, Fudge always acts like humans, like muggles, are just like children that need tending as yep. opposed to a fully functioning society in its own right that yeah. they've chosen not to have anything to do with. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, Fudge sucks. I'm glad that we later learn in this chapter that he got sacked. Yeah, I, and I'm I'm not really sure about about his replacement's position on muggle relations. No, I'm not But I have either. to assume it's a little more pragmatic than, oh, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And then they never do. Exactly. I mean, I, the, the bar that Fudge sets is like on the floor. So I don't think it can be any lower. So but low. <laughs> we'll have to see. Fudge admits that at this point, he feared that Voldemort might still be alive but he was more focused on Sirius because, quote, he's not dangerous unless he's got support. So at least Fudge had some sort of reasoning for putting all his efforts into Sirius, but still kind of stupid. Yeah. That's all we get from that flashback. We go to another flashback about the Quidditch World Cup, which, as we mentioned, the Prime Minister says Quidditch with a KW. <laughs> There's a great interaction of Fudge nonchalantly mentioning that they're bringing in dragons and a sphinx for the Triwizard Tournament, and they have to, you know, bring this across the country to do so <laughs> and the prime minister goes like uh, i uh, what dragons yeah he's <laughs> like yeah we're gonna import some dragons and he was like uh, uh, okay and the minister of magic is <laughs> like yeah we, it's like policy to tell you whenever we import large dangerous creatures mm -hmm. and the prime minister's just like ha, 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 cool <laughs> Fun, neat, thanks. Yeah, he basically goes, uh, what, dragons? And then Fudge goes, yes, three, and a sphinx. Well, good day, and then leaves. Like, what? You have to wonder where the line is. Is like, they obviously he didn't have to tell them when they were bringing hippogriffs in, or whatever blast ended scroots oh, or whatever my apparently favorite like a character. threshold where you have to tell them <laughs> i miss blast ended scroots i'm so mad they got sent up from the film they're <laughs> my favorite character <laughs> yeah another flashback is to the larger scale azkaban breakout um this time fudge basically pops in tells him and then leaves before the prime minister could even say a word oh my goodness that is the the last flashback because we go back to reality you know oh there goes gravity and now <laughs> we realize why the prime minister is so spooked because basically, not only does Fudge only come in and say bad news, but they've gotten worse every single time. So with him coming in, the and also the first, <laughs> the first time Fudge came in, Fudge was like, "Cool, we should never, we shouldn't really ever see each other again unless something horrible happens." Yep. And now we've seen him like six times in the in one term. <laughs> exactly. So this guy comes in, and the premise just thinks, "Ah, oh, fuck! Like what <laughs> now? Uh, not after this week. I just couldn't get any you worse. lime green harbinger of doom." <laughs> So we learned that a bridge was busted and then people were murdered and that Herbert Chorley, who had been, you know, acting strange, was moved to St. Mungo's. Fudge has to tell him that Voldemort is back. The prime minister asks, what about that black fellow? Fudge says that, oh, right, he was not guilty and he was killed on ministry grounds. Oh, yeah, he was innocent, but also now he's dead. So it's a wash, basically. <laughs> yeah, so it's no big deal. The prime minister at first feels pity, but then is mad at Fudge's smugness because, quote... 
there had never been a murder in any of the government departments under his charge, dot, 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 not yet anyway, dot, 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 which is like, this dude is contemplating murdering Cornelius Fudge <laughs> in his office, which like, I can't blame him that much, but it is a little dark. Like, this prime minister does not fuck around. Like, he's not messing around at all. Yeah. Gosh. <laughs> this prime minister is tough as nails. Yes. He's just like, you know what? I might kill this guy. I really just you know, yeah. Hold me it's, back. It's hold me back. Bad. I don't like this guy is tough. I would not. I wouldn't mess with this dude at all. So they argue back and forth about the bridge thing. It's called the blockade bridge. And apparently, what happened was Voldemort threatened a mass Muggle killing unless Fudge stood aside for him. And before he can explain further, he's cut off by the prime minister blaming him for the deaths. And Fudge is like, look, I'm not going to negotiate with terrorists. And so basically Voldemort took out that bridge because he was trying to blackmail Fudge. And, you know, Fudge didn't give in. So he destroyed a bridge and killed a bunch of muggles that were driving across it in their cars, which sucks. And despite a clear and present danger to the public... The prime minister isn't allowed to get on TV mm -hmm. and be like, hey, there's a really powerful dark <laughs> wizard. And by the way, magic is real, but also yeah, the collapsing yeah, bridges, y'all. Yeah. yeah, Fudge is like, you wouldn't have given into blackmailing, would you? And the prime minister is like, I wouldn't have let it get to that, which is like, oh, hell yeah, prime minister. Yeah, get some prime minister. <laughs> so they talk about this quote unquote hurricane in West County, but they're only calling it a hurricane because of the destruction that was left. What it really was, was the Death Eaters and Giants wreaking havoc. So that was the uh, the cover up. And then Fudge has to mention that giants are now on Team Voldemort, which we all saw coming. I do like the mention that not like parts of England are just so uninhabited that you could just pass over like a, a bunch of giants tearing up the countryside as like, oh, it was a hurricane. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Because like nobody saw it because it was just so sparsely populated. Yeah. I don't, I don't know anything about a uh, West country, uh, but that's what they say the area is. I don't, I, I guess I would get this joke more if I was British, but uh, apparently just maybe the West country just sucks. Like, I guess it'd be the equivalent of being like, oh yeah, there was a hurricane in Montana and everyone would be like, oh, okay, whatever. From what <laughs> I can glean from British media and Brits that have, gone down back alleys to give me this information <laughs> um apparently there is london and there is the country mm -hmm. and london's the fun part okay <laughs> sorry to any of your british fans that well, i what about one of my friends offended. who i will have on the podcast for this book because he was an extra in the sixth movie uh one of my youtube buddies cool. he lived uh, I, I can't remember the name of it i want to say it was called brighton but i'm not positive but it was like a really nice suburb. So I think some areas are nice. But like there's just there's some places there where you there's just like not enough people around. Yeah. That nobody saw the giants. Yep, exactly. And then any of the ones that did might be gone. Oh, so um, morale at the Ministry of Magic is already very low, but it is even lower now because of the loss of Amelia Bones, which sucks because she was so cool. Amelia Bones was awesome. She was the head of the Aww. Department of Magical Law Enforcement. We met her in the Wizengamot session. She came to Harry's defense. She helped him out. Her daughter goes to Hogwarts. So she was murdered apparently by Voldemort in person. And the evidence shows that she put up a good fight. So at least she, you know, went down swinging trying to stand up to Voldemort. Went down swinging. We'll miss your bones. We will. Uh, pour one out for Amelia Bones. It made it into the Muggle newspapers that there was just a woman who was killed on a room that was locked from the inside. So it's just this, you know. The, the repercussions of Voldemort's evil is making its way into Muggle newspapers, but, of course, not allowed to explain what's happening. Yeah, of course you're not allowed to tell people nah. and have an informed public. That's not good, apparently. Nah, that make way too much sense. Apparently, a lady named Emmeline Vance was also killed, but we don't learn anything about her or what happened. It's just mentioned that she also died. Apparently, she's, like, a member of the Order of the Phoenix that we just haven't met and now never yes, will. Yes, exactly. I don't know if they cover her later, but it's just, like, she was important, we promise. Well, I like, I like the quick mention that, like the order of the phoenix is bigger than just like ron's six parents. people yeah <laughs> yeah like like the just mentions that like no it is actually a large network you guys are just seeing like one cell of it yeah i mean i'm sure that it has now since gained more traction now that voldemort is back i'm sure it was kind of like being in the army reserve mm -hmm. where now it's like oh we have a war it's like all right god let me dust off the old wand yeah <laughs> and go to action we also learn a terrifying thing which is that the Dementors are out running amok and are breeding 
which causes mist everywhere. They had alluded to the weather being really poor before. Uh, I didn't know Dementors could breed. Baby Dementors sound horrible. That's a horrifying prospect. Do they? Here's here's the question. <laughs> yup, yup. Do they kiss while they do it? <laughs> Like, how does dementor sex work? I need to know. I'm like, oh my god, there's so many questions. Like, do they? Is it, oh, okay. So here's my guess. Okay. <laughs> they have the kiss of death, right? Mm -hmm. What if to impregnate one, they have the kiss of life, which like plants the seed into the other dementor? Oh, they put <laughs> one of the souls that they took out of a human <gasps> and they make a new dementor. Oh, That's terrifying. Oh, we've come up with an amazing new fan theory. I don't know if they describe what it is later but yeah dementors fuck or at least do something to breed which is terrifying absolutely terrifying see now i'm just imagining like two dementors like one on top of the other as they're flying like dragonflies you know? <laughs> oh yeah right 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 or june bugs same thing <laughs> where they're just flying through the air and they're casually just kind of fucking oh my God. that'd be horrifying <laughs> yeah <what? laughs> the hype train doesn't stop here because we also learn that fudge reveals that he's been sacked three days ago, even though he's in the office, which makes me confused as to why he was able to still have this meeting, but I don't know, whatever. Oh, it's because it's because the new prime minister sent him. Oh, right, right, yeah, because he's an advisor. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, honestly, good riddance. Apparently, the entire magical community was very unified in wanting his removal. Fudge makes some offhand comment like, I've never seen them more unified in wanting something so badly before, except for me to be fired. Well, yeah, <laughs> Because they found out that you lied to them mm -hmm. for five years mm -hmm. and said that Voldemort wasn't back. It's very reminiscent of a current thing happening in our country for someone that has a very low approval rating. Hmm. Oh, I sure hope it does end up in a similar way and then he doesn't get to stay around in an advisory capacity oh, to the new government. Oh, oh, we'll just have to see what happens. But Fudge lied and perhaps this current person has lied too. We will soon learn. <laughs> Let's find out. Oh, God. <laughs> back to magic, please. <laughs> yeah, back to things that don't make me depressed. Yeah. Fudge says that the reason that he's here is to catch the prime minister up to speed and introduce him to his new successor. He says that his successor will be there soon, but they are currently writing a letter to Dumbledore. And I think this is personally a very clever way to let the reader still try to guess who it is, but not make the reader think that it's going to be Dumbledore. <laughs> like, yeah, no, that's very true. Like you have to say up front, no, 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 Dumbledore is not the minister of magic. We're not Don't get too that. excited. <laughs> so Fudge mentions that Dumbledore has been stubborn about, quote, not being able to convince the boy, but it doesn't say what it is. And I don't know if Fudge is hinting that they tried to convince Dumbledore to just let Voldemort kill Harry. Like, I don't know if that's what the blackmail thing was, if it was like hand over Harry and I won't murder people. Like, I don't know if what's going on, they don't say it explicitly. But if Fudge is implying yeah. that some people think that they should just sacrifice Harry to get Voldemort to calm down, that's not very nice, Mr. Fudge. He's a child. Maybe that's part of the reason that there was such unified hatred against Ooh. him is because Fudge was like, well, maybe we should give up Harry Potter. And all of the magic people were like, excuse me, my I, uh, one precious child, Harry Potter. How dare you? That's ooh, I like it. I really like it. I hope that's what it is. And that would make me feel a lot better about wizards if that was what made them hate Fudge so much. There's many reasons to hate Fudge, but that could be one. Mm -hmm. Fudge says that the new minister is named Scrimjower, which is not a name. Is that how it's pronounced? Is it Scrimger? Scr Scr oh, Scrimger. Okay. Yeah. Regardless, not a name. Again, made up <laughs> names, made up pronunciations. You just pick what you like and roll yeah. with it. So we then see the entrance of Rufus Scrimger, who I am surprised that I've never heard this dude's name before. There are like a lot of names that going into this that I heard, like I knew that Kingsley Shacklebolt was a name. I knew that Horace Slughorn, who we meet in chapter four, was a name. I've literally never heard Scrimger before. So I don't know if this guy is just not that big of a deal or what. I mean, he's kind of as big a deal as Fudge was, but like not for as long. And also there was other stuff going on. Sure. I actually think Rufus Scrimger gets a really bad rap. I mean, as far as I can tell, like you've never heard of him. Like he's actually a pretty good character. And from the bit that we see of him, a lot more competent than Cornelius Fudge yeah. for sure. I mean, again, pretty low bar. <laughs> yeah. And his role just kind of gets steamrolled by like Dumbledore and what he's doing. And, you know, Voldemort's back and like 
the government is defenseless. Well, like... He's doing his best, and he's actually not doing a horrible job. Yeah, it made me a bit sad that you learned that Dumbledore doesn't really like this guy. I thought it would have been really interesting since we've had such an incompetent prime minister. I think it would be a cool dynamic if they switched the replacement to be this really sharp guy who was on top of stuff and was really helpful. I think that would have been a fun dynamic to see as like someone working alongside with Dumbledore rather than actively trying to undermine him. I thought that could have been a really fun dynamic, but I don't know if we're going to get that. I think they're setting up to think that like he might be on the Dark Lord's side undercover or like he might be a double agent or something. I'm not sure if that's what they're going for. I'm not sure if how that pays off. I Again, it's been a while (laughs) since I read books. So they say that Rufus looks like, quote, an old lion which makes me think, I don't know, is this dude Mufasa or something? But the first impressions that we get from Scrimger is that he just doesn't mess around. You learn that he used to be in charge of the Aurors, so he had a very serious position. It makes me just kind of think he's like a militarian type guy. Yeah, was he like in Amelia Bones' position before? She was the head of law enforcement. He was the head of Aurors. So I guess she would be like Commissioner Gordon, and he would be more like in charge of the Marines or like, or I don't know, like the SWAT team. Like he, I think he has a, he is like more specifically with people fighting evil. Whereas bones was over all of law enforcement. So it could just be like regular wizards committing crime. This guy specifically is in charge of the oars who fight dark wizards. Yeah. He basically has a more specific, group of people that he fights against his role is like more intense but more specified and bones is is broader but less intense in law enforcement there are more militaristic (laughs) arms of the oars these are their stories (laughs) oh love it uh (laughs) man now i just want a like a law and order svu harry potter (laughs) spinoff i want so many fictional law and orders like law and order harry potter law and order like Star Wars would be great. Lord of the Rings. Law and Order Gotham City would have been so cool. Like there's so many like <laughs> fictional Law and Orders I would watch the crap. Law out and of. Order Star Wars just makes me think they'd be like, oh, the scene of the crime. We know that the perpetrator must be a stormtrooper. Why is that? There's 1,500 bullet holes in the wall. <laughs> like- <laughs> <laughs> Ballistics would be ridiculous. <laughs> Well, we looked at the wall. There were 9,000 blaster holes in it, so clearly <laughs> the suspect had to have been a stormtrooper. Oh, man. So, <laughs> so, so Scrimjar doesn't mess around. He comes in, immediately locks the door, closes the window curtains, and gets right to business, which I actually kind of like. He's not messing around. That's what I'm saying. He's, he's like a business guy. He's not here to be like, oh, don't worry about it. Rufus is like, no, here's the sitch. Let's do it. Yeah, exactly. So Rufus says that he is doing all of this because he doesn't want the prime minister to fall under the imperious curse, which is a possibility. He alludes that he sets it up in a way where you make it think that his secretary is at fault and like potentially a threat. So he says something, he's like, oh yeah, like that new secretary you got, did you notice him? And the prime minister screams at the top of his lungs, I'm not getting rid of Kingsley Shacklebolt, he's too efficient, which I I thought was so great because I totally was like, oh no, is the secretary a mole? And then you learn it's Kingsley, it's like, oh, this is the best thing ever, I love Kingsley Shacklebolt so much. He is a mole, he's just the best mole. (laughs) Exactly, he's like Enrique Iglesias' mole, where it's like, actually makes you look really attractive. Oh yes. (laughs) So the prime minister screams, I don't want to get rid of Kingsley Shacklebolt, He's efficient. And Rufus replies, that's because he's a wizard, which boom, great. Love it. I really like Rufus, honestly, with retorts that quick on the draw. Oh, baby. Uh, Oh, baby. What's not the love? He's got that like quick bravado that I really like in my fictional government leaders. Mm -hmm. People who have listened to my show are paradoxical. know that I really like those sort of like charismatic scheming leaders that like I already pulled the lever 15 minutes ago, you know? Oh, yes. Like my favorite trope in anything. And this happened so many times in the fifth book. So I hope it happens in the sixth book here is when people enter a room on a dramatic line or after a dramatic line. Like that's my favorite (laughs) trope in the world. I want an action movie one day where every time a new character enters a scene, it's on a line where they like have a cool witty reply. Like that's my favorite thing in the world. Oh, that's such a good <laughs> so, superpower. When, that's like, if oh, you... <laughs> that's the best X-Man. Yeah. Dramatic <laughs> entrance boy. Oh my goodness. That's so good. I need that. I need that. <laughs> uh, so you learn that Kingsley Shacklebolt has been assigned to protect the prime minister of the muggle world, which is good. At least Rufus has done something to make the relations better by assigning, like you said, you have some sort of relations officer or secretary of relations or whatever you want to call him, like someone that is going to 
bridge the gap. Someone whose job it is to make sure the muggles are protected, yeah. because if you're not going to give them yeah. agency, it's at least your responsibility to protect them. Yes. So I'm supporting Rufus Scrimger. I hope that him and Dumbledore settle their beef and everything ends up okay there. So Scrimger brings up Herbert Chorley, who we learn is the junior minister, and says that he has fallen subject to a poorly performed imperious curse, which is why he was spending his time, quote, impersonating a duck in public. Oh, so good. And what a great <laughs> reveal. Like, they had been talking about him all the, the, whole, the whole chapter, chapter. And it's just like, he was acting weird. He's going to be spending a lot more time with his family. And only we get, like, the late reveal that he was quacking like a duck on the job. Exactly. And now he's in St. Mungo's. The, uh, the healers have been sent to investigate and try to, to cure him. And he attempted to strangle all three. What a violent duck. I mean, yeah, I don't know how you go from like impersonating a duck to actually like doing what an evil person under an imperious curse would do. So I don't know yeah. who put it on or what's going on there, but yeah, violent duck. Maybe there they was like a trigger word. There was like a an A switch and a B Ooh. switch, and he's like, duck, 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 and they were like, let me help you, sir, and the help is the trigger word, and he just strangles him. <laughs> murder, murder, murder. <laughs> sleeper agent, but the sleeper is a duck. Ooh, that would be great. That's way better than Captain America Winter Soldier. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. That movie was phenomenal. <laughs> Though I am bothered by the fact that Captain America's like, I liked this guy. We have to say him it's like dude just if we just got rid of this dude it would be so much less problematic like there's no civil war if you just get rid of bucky but he is my friend that is true <laughs> but also bucky's is one true love and you can fight me on that true one. true no that's i ship it i ship it for sure yeah yeah way better than him uh hooking up with like his lover's daughter or niece or whatever it was oh my god a creepy b lamest kiss scene ever it was really bad it was super lame it everything about that was very awful. awkward <laughs> I'm glad we're on the same page. That's what we in the LGBTQ plus community call hetero nonsense. Ah, yes. I support that. I haven't heard hetero nonsense. That's great. And I need to to see more of it because there is there is a fair bit of hetero nonsense out there, especially just in a little bit of hetero stuff. nonsense. There was a man and a woman in this movie and they spent a lot of time together. Well, it's the end of the movie. They've got to be in love now. Uh, like that was something I really liked about rogue one. They didn't kiss at the end, right? Like when they were dying, they were just like, Hey, no, they were just like on the job. And then they like hugged for a job. Well done. That was high stress. And then mm -hmm. they like exploded and it was great. Oh, spoilers for rogue. One. <laughs> oh, okay. If you haven't seen rogue one by now, what are you doing? Th says the man reading Harry Potter for the first time in 2018. <laughs> <laughs> oh Congratulations, you played yourself. I am the pot calling the kettle a pot. Uh, <laughs> God, but what I was really going to say is like, the premise of Rogue One is that it's what happened before the fourth movie and everyone went into that knowing they die at the end. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I don't even know that much about star Wars. Cause I've only seen like a handful of the movies and I knew going into rogue one that they were going to die at Ooh, the end. There's a good spinoff mini series as you do in star Wars. So I already have lined up of all the things cause I've seen some star Wars, so it's not as good, but I have, uh, I've never seen any game of Thrones. So that would be Godderless for G O T, you know, Godderless. Ooh. And then, uh, I've only seen like very recently, my girlfriend made me watch the first Lord of the Rings movie. Cause it's her favorite franchise so i could do lotterless for lord of the rings because i've <laughs> never done that um there, there's a lot of things i had this weird i had this weird childhood where i was like was a nerd but wasn't into like nerdy things and then now i'm a nerd and i'm like oh right i've missed out on everything no that's okay um uh, one of the the writers and producers that I work with, Eli Barraza, uh, is working on a nonfiction podcast because she also hasn't seen like a bunch of event TV, mm -hmm. and um, we're we're working on that. I don't want to like good. spill no, beans here, that's but good. we're working that's on good. something. I don't know. I like nerded out about other things. Like I played a lot of video games, and I am very nerdy about basketball in like not just like oh i watch it a lot it's like no i study like the salary cap and like what the mid-level exception means and like trade negotiations <laughs> like so i get in i don't know i'm i got into different nerdy things but now that i've opened the world to harry potter like oh man anything's in play now because <laughs> if i can if i can swallow the magic pill i can get into stuff like the adventure zone has opened my eyes to dungeons and dragons and i'm like crap how did i never play uh, dungeons and dragons like i really want to play D D now uh, for for my birthday i uh ran a game of D D, and uh, amanda and julia from spirits played <gasps> with me oh my gosh lovely people 
gosh. What lovely so humans. That sounds like a great game of D&D. Anyway, we have a little bit of this chapter to finish up. So, <laughs> Herbert Troy Lee was a duck. Now he's trying to strangle people. They have him in St. Mungo's, trying to keep him out of the muggle world for a little bit, get his head back on straight, and then he'll be good to go. Rufus says that he may send Fudge again to the Prime Minister in the future, which I'm sure the Prime Minister loves to hear, because we learned that Fudge is staying on in an advisory position, which... A bit of a downgrade, but, you know, at least he's going to be, I guess, doing something productive. I don't know how useful Fudge's advice will be, though. Does that mean that Rufus hired Fudge as the Minister of Muggle Relations? I don't know. Maybe. If he did, like, what a slap in the face to Fudge to be like, Hi, I'm taking over your job. Would you like to work under me in a position that you should have had for the past five years? That's like, hey, I'm taking your job and I'm going to do it better than you and I'm going to make you watch. (laughs) first hand because you have the job (laughs) yeah Uh, so as they are about to leave the prime minister pleads that they are wizards so that they should be able to fix all of this right because they can use magic to do anything and you get a great quote from rufus before they leave he says the trouble is the other side can do magic too mr prime minister And then Rufus Scrimger puts on his sunglasses and the who starts playing. (laughs) Wait, actually, though, he puts it on it as he walks through the the flu powder. (laughs) Like he throws the flu powder into the into the the fireplace. And as the flames explode, they go. (laughs) And then the CSI Miami text shows up over. (laughs) Uh, that's the end of this chapter. And that's going to be the end of this episode of Potterless. I thought that this chapter was going to take a really long time, but it took a whole episode, which is chill. So we will stop this for now cool. and continue this discussion later. But yeah, how are you feeling about this first chapter? I thought it was the greatest opening to any of the books, and I notoriously hated, hated all of the openings. I thought they were all so boring and such a just you had to really trudge through them and this one was so pleasant i loved it i read it with an ear-to-ear smile i think that this is probably one of the key chapters in opening up the fan fiction possibilities to such a wider world oh yeah totally because harry potter can get so like narrow and you're like at the school doing magic and learning things and harry potter's the main character and then all of a sudden you're like oh governments still exist and like yep yep weather and like geopolitical relations are still a thing and you're like wow this world has so many possibilities that we're not looking at yeah yes 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 no it was good it's really fun to see the outside world i like that this chapter and then the next one or not from harry's perspective i it made me wish that there was more of it i hope that there's more to come but i really liked this chapter it was super fun and just like getting to see the muggle perspective is something really exciting too because that's something we pretty much have not seen at all Mm -hmm. and we finally get like our first named muggle character that has this, this experience with these crazy people. And uh, I is he named? really liked it. Do they ever give his name? Oh, no, they don't. Just they the just Prime keep Minister. calling him the prime minister the whole time. Wow. I mean, I guess it makes sense so that they don't have to get into this weird thing where if they name him, then they have to make a stance of, are we doing, you know, is this a real president yeah. or, you know, is Jack Bauer the president or whatever? That's true. I'm just saying, like, even when it's the prime minister, you can't give the muggles a name. Nope, can't. I guess no muggle ever gets, or no, I was going to say no muggle ever gets named, but you know who is named? Herbert Chorley. Oh, true, 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 true. He might be the only muggle whose name we know. (laughs) (laughs) Or or I guess, no, I guess technically Hermione's parents, right? They're muggles. What are Hermione's parents' names? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Granger. (laughs) They sure are. We know they're dentists. Ooh, this could be a fun version of the Bechdel test, except it's, are there two muggle characters (laughs) <laughs> that, that are have in a names scene and talk to each other about non-magical talk- things. <laughs> uh, we could call it the Chorley test. <laughs> <laughs> the Chorley test. I love it. Oh man, so good. Well, this was super fun. Misha, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Is is there any particular of your 58 jillion podcasts you want to you want to plug? to the listeners um yeah i will say this we just announced that um ours paradoxica season three is the last season so (gasps) if you were hesitant to check it out um we're gonna finish it up and then it'll be like a whole complete thing and it's gonna be really cool yeah can you give a quick pitch for it for people that are unfamiliar oh sure um it's so it's a show about uh, a young woman who's a millennial through and through who accidentally invents a time machine that only takes you to the past and gets stuck in the middle of the cold war 
uh, working for the U.S. government to make time travel spies. Love it, love it. And all of the various moral quandaries therein. Yeah, so I, I have not started listening to it yet, but I've met all of the people involved with it at PodCon, and you guys are just the loveliest people. Well, like anytime you. someone's like, oh, I do so-and-so for Ars Paradox, I was like, oh, that's why you're so nice and amazing. <laughs> so I can only imagine that this podcast is also phenomenal and I can't wait to start it once I plow through all the Adventure Zone because I can't stop listening to it. Yeah, no, that's 100% valid. I will s- neglect every other podcast I listen to in favor <laughs> of the Adventure Zone always. Yep, it's so good. Well, Misha, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to hear this and also to talk about the other ones. I'm going to be back. Yeah, we'll, we'll be discussing chapters two through four on the next episode. But until then, listeners, thank you so much for joining. And until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, and as we say every end of a Potterless episode, wizard on. Wizard on. <laughs> <laughs> If you're enjoying Potterless, but you want something more, why don't you get involved in one of our amazing social media communities? You can check us out at facebook.com slash Potterless, twitter.com slash PotterlessPod, and instagram.com slash PotterlessPodcast, or you could join our brand new private Facebook group. If you search for Potterless Fancy Private Group on Facebook, you can join and have discussions and get to know other listeners and make amazing new best friends. So all of that can be found on our website, which is PotterlessPodcast.com. Potterless was created by Mike Schubert. It is hosted by Mike Schubert. It is edited by Mike Schubert. It is produced by Mike Schubert, as well as Leanne Davis, Andreas Oselby, Vicky Garcia, Aaron Johnson, Erica and Calvin Bauer, Michael Vandersley, Sadie Bear, Jesse Horgan, Natalie Klobuchar, Deborah Wilkins, Daisy Curtin, Sutter, Klaus Serlopu, Michael Butte, Sean Jones, Alexander Stark, Rebecca Adamek, Frank Chiodo, Marchismo, Tori Larsic, Samantha Rose, Troy Kaplinger, Juan Sanfeliu, Sheila Vidya Nothan, Jenna Dowsett, Kieran Webb, Luis Nusak, Akanksha Saxena, and Sarah. Salvador, web designed by Kelly Beckman, and the music is by Bettina Campamanis. Thank you guys so much for listening, and until next time, as they say in the wizarding world of Harry Potter, wizard on! <laughs>